Bring your Bibles to church, and if you do, I am speaking today from the New Testament, 1 Timothy, chapter 6. 1 Timothy, chapter 6. most effective ministry is the pastor who preaches from the Bible and uh, <clears throat> I think if I were to pick a kind of sermon that I like to do best it's topical but that's not the most uh, effective or productive kind of message uh, but sometimes it's necessary to preach on a topic but to do Preaching, they call it exposition, expository preaching. And I'm not saying that I am necessarily good at that or a master of it. I'm not. I do know that if you have, if you have ever heard J. Vernon McGee on radio, he was a master at expository sermon. Every five years, he preached through the Bible. Every five years. He would begin in Genesis and go through the whole Bible. He would take every verse of Scripture. I'm about finished with Joshua, and I didn't realize that Joshua is such a hard book to read through. And I know that some of you are reading through your Bibles, but when you get to chapter 15 and on to about chapter 21, it's very difficult because it gives almost all the names of the strange towns in the country of Israel or Palestine. You have to read so many names. And <clears throat> I've been enjoying it because uh, I have a copy of the Word of God from beginning to end on, on not cassette, but on CDs. And the man who reads it is very adept at pronouncing names. And so he reads it and I look at the Bible and I'm having fun doing that, especially when you get to places where you have all these kind of names that you, uh, uh, that you have to read. First Timothy. Uh, we've covered five chapters. And Paul was a converted Pharisee. He was the religious. Pharisees were the religious leaders in Israel. Paul was a converted Pharisee. He converted from Judaism to Christianity. And that began on the road to Damascus when the light from heaven shined upon him and he was stricken to the ground. So in 1 Timothy, the first five chapters, he gives instructions about to Timothy. Timothy was a young pastor, about 30 years of age. And he gave instructions to what should be taught to the new Christians in the Christian church at Ephesus. They met in homes. They didn't have buildings uh, like we do, but they met in homes. And he was instructing Timothy as to what should be taught in the church uh, about the position of men and women in the church, the qualifications of elders and deacons, and in general, he tried to teach Timothy what kind of leadership they should have in their new church. God expects the leaders to be godly, spiritual, an example to all. And he mentions also in one of the chapters that as the end of the age, the age in which we live today, from the time of Christ to the time of his actual second coming, now you folk know that I teach the Word of God and explain the Word of God. You've heard me say this, but I'm going to repeat it. Dispensationally. You think that God treated Adam and Eve in their perfect state like He treats us? Not at all. He treated them different. Now let's remember 
And I know this repetition, but I want us to get it. People from Adam to the last person that will ever be born on earth or in the millennial kingdom, I don't think there's going to be any reproduction after the millennium. Now, if you think there is, you raise your hand. I don't know. I really haven't thought about that. I don't think that in... I know that in the millennium, when Christ rules and reigns on the earth for 1,000 years, people will live and die. And sinners will die up to the age of 100. But believers will live on to the end of the millennium. They'll live for a thousand years. They'll live like the people did early on in the book of Genesis. But at the end of the age, in 1 Timothy, Paul tries to teach Timothy what the end of the age will look like and that people will depart from the faith. I happened to be on our iPad yesterday, and um, I was looking up about China, whether they've reached their goal of limiting their birth rates so that as many people will be born as die, and that they will stabilize the birth rate in China and on that, it said that that won't happen until 2030. Did you know that there are some nations in Europe that are now losing people? More people are dying than are being born. And uh, Russia itself is concerned about that uh, because of abortion and other things. That isn't happening in our country. Our, our population continue, continues to increase. But... Paul mentions to Timothy, he says, at the end of the age, people will depart from the faith. And, and so in chapter 5, just before chapter 6, which we're looking at today, he gives instructions to the church of how widows are to be treated by the church. And that brings us to chapter 6. First thing it talks about is the relationship of employers to their employees. Some of you are employers. Some of us are employees. I don't know what you consider me. I work for the church, in a sense. I work for God first, but I work for the church. But in chapter 6, he says, let as many bond servants, that's an employee, or it could have been a slave, back in those days, as many, let as many bond service as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor. He's saying to the employee, your boss needs to be worthy of a lot of honor. It may be that you don't even like him. You know, sometimes an employee won't like his boss because they may be treated wrong. But Paul is saying, I want you to teach the people in your church that if you're an employee, you need to honor your boss. That comes from the Lord. That's what he wanted us to know. I've worked for people that I didn't particularly like, and uh, they were mean, rough talkers. But God had to remind me, he's your boss, you work for him, he pays you. You need, to, you need to treat him with honor. And so, there's a reason for that. So that the name of God and his doctrine, his teaching, may not be blasphemed. What do you think that employers think of Christians who don't do a full day's work for a full day's pay. They don't think, a, a boss will not think well of you if you don't give your boss a full day's work. 
And so there are some very clear things in Scripture about that. So that the name of God and his doctrine may not be blasphemed. I remember how non-Christians look at Christians. I had uh, a member of a family member, not a close member, but he was a beer drinker. And I use this as an example. And his close relative saw him drinking beer one day and he said to him, I thought you were a Christian. The problem was that the other guy that said that was an alcoholic. He was an alcoholic. He got, he got it when he got his hands on a, a bottle of beer, he couldn't stop drinking. And so he said, actually to his brother-in-law, I thought you were a Christian. And so when we as Christians, we stand out in front of people, maybe not, not related to drinking, we stand out in front of people and they expect us to live a good life. And if we don't, they will not speak well of us. And so Paul says to Timothy, teach the people in your church. You need to have a good testimony so that the name of God and his doctrine may not be blasphemed. And those who have believing masters, those who have believing masters, let them not despise them because they are brothers. When we lived in LaGrange, Wyoming, I heard of a rancher who lived in the area of Cheyenne and he had several employees. He was a Christian, and he determined, he said, the people that work for me, I'm going to treat right. And he actually gave them limited partnership in his ranch because he wanted them to know that he was a Christian, and he wanted to treat them well, and he treated them well. And he never lost an employee, simply because he was the kind of boss that honored God in his livelihood. The Christian should render a full day's work for a full day's pay. Now, I know that there's a debate going on right now. You hear, I heard it on television this last week that men and women should receive equal pay. I don't have anything to say about it except one thing. You remember that parable that the Lord gave? And I don't know exactly where it's found right now. But he gave this parable that this man hired a person at 6 o'clock in the morning who worked until 6 o'clock in the evening. And then he hired other people that worked lesser hours. And finally, he, worked one, he hired one man at 5 o'clock in the evening. And that man worked till 6 o'clock. He only worked one hour. And you will remember the parable that the boss paid every one of them equally. They all got the same play, pay. And then the guy that worked 12 hours and received the same amount of money as the one who worked one hour, he complained to his boss. He said, boss, that isn't right. The moral of the story and of the parable is this. The boss has the right to pay whatever he wants to pay who, who works under him. Let's say that you have a man who has four children and he works hard and he gets paid an amount of money that satisfies his needs. And then a lady comes along and works and does the same amount of work but she gets paid less. I'm not saying that she should get paid less. I'm not saying that at all. That depends upon the boss. He can pay her whatever he wants to. And what I'm saying is that the Bible teaches that the person who employs people, I think it's scriptural, he can pay whatever he wants to pay because it's his business. 
Now he ought to be honest in his pay. He ought to pay a decent wage to both men and women. And so an employer should treat his Christian employee with dignity and fairness. In fact, it would probably be good if he would be more than fair. So the relation of employers and employees, and the second thing is in relation to false teachers. First Timothy chapter six, verse three. If anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and to the doctrine which accords with godliness, he is proud knowing nothing, but is obsessed with disputes and arguments over words, from which come envy, strife, reviling, evil suspicions, useless wranglings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. From such withdraw yourselves. What are the characteristics of false teachers? Number one, they're usually proud. Almost always. False teachers are usually proud. Paul says here they're ignorant. They argue over unimportant things that are really unimportant. I think, and I, I don't make any question about it, I think Jehovah's Witnesses are false teachers. They do not believe that Jesus Christ is God. That's their main error. They do not accept him as we accept Jesus being God. They argue over the fact that they are, or at least within their group, they are part of the 144,000. 12,000 from each tribe of Israel. And so they maintain that among them, they contain the 144,000. I think that's ignorance on their part, but it's certainly not what the Word of God teaches. They argue over things that are not important. And creating arguments, envy, jealousy, fighting, slander, and evil suspicions. They cause trouble, Paul says. Their minds are corrupt. They are not truthful. And they, they take their position as a way to get rich. They take advantage of people. They try to get rich that way. The third thing that Paul talks about is contentment. Listen to what it says. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Let me read that again. Godliness with contentment is great gain. And then in verse 7, I always kind of laugh at this. We brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. I only saw one of our children born. That was our daughter, Suzanne. What a grand experience. I don't think that Shirley appreciated me being in the delivery room because she was hurting big time. But I was glad that I could. But you know, when the little gal was born, slipped into this earth, I used to think that all babies were ugly. I've, I've changed my mind about that, right? I imagine when, I imagine when my dad looked at me, he must have thought, what has God wrought? But when Suzanne was born, I thought it was great. But you know, she didn't have any blonde hair. She didn't have any rings on her fingers. I don't know if she had any hair at all. Did she have hair or any? I can't remember. <laughs> she probably did. But the, the point of the matter is, when she came into the world, she didn't have anything. You know, kind of slimy. And Scripture says, the way you come into the world, that's the way you're going to go out of the world. You're not going to have anything. You better be sure and take the gold out of your teeth because in the waiting room, they might take that away from you. I don't know. I've heard, I've heard of, and I'm not talking about the morticians in Greeley. 
But some morticians have actually done that. Remove, I've got a little gold in my mouth, and it's not worth very much. But I, I'm, honey, you better take it out when they put me in there. So somebody, you can have my gold. It is certain that when we came into the world, we brought nothing and we won't take anything out. We won't carry it with us. And uh, having food and clothing, with these, we shall be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and harmful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money, this has been changed in the New King James. They have felt like the better translation of this. It's not that the love of money is the root of all evil. It's a root of all evil. The love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. So the last point of my message today is about greed. About greed. Are you greedy? Am I greedy? Money has no morality about it. It's amoral. It's not good or evil. It's not bad. It's not evil in itself. It is a cause, however, for continually falling into temptation. I have been interested in the last couple of months of looking on the internet and finding out what has happened to all the money that is paid to athletes. Occasionally we have watched Dancing with the Stars. What's the guy's name from the Broncos? Somebody help me out. You're looking at a $70 million man. Wow. $70 million. That's a lot of money. Just for hitting people on the football field. That's all he does. He likes to hit the quarterbacks. $70 million bucks for doing that. Read about all these guys. Because greedy people are compulsive. They're compulsive about money. They are continually trapped by their desire to have more and more. I think of the boxer who has made millions of dollars, $50 million or more. And uh, Joe Lewis, first time I ever heard anything on the radio was a boxing match by Joe Lewis back in the 40s. And uh, we had a, a radio in our 36 Ford, and Dad would turn it on, and we'd listen to Joe Lewis fight. He lost it all. Went to Las Vegas, didn't have any money. But in his time, he made a lot of money. But he couldn't keep it. Those who are driven by the sin of greed, the Bible says, may find their end is destruction and hell itself. Love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows, like with an arrow. Solomon said, Ecclesiastes 5 and verse 10, He who loves silver will not be satisfied with silver, nor he who loves abundance with increase. Satan knew that he had found a man when he found Achan. Remember the story of Achan in the book of Joshua? Well, chapter 2, chapter 3, where Achan, when they tried to capture the city of Ai, and he found a little wedge of gold and said, I'm going to take that home and put it under my pillow. And he did. And God judged him for it. And uh, it cost him his life, in fact, and the members of his family's life, just because he desired gold. And Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 10, Demas has forsaken me, 
having loved this present world and has departed for Thessalonica, Crescens to Galatia, Titus for Dalmatia, but Demas, having loved this present world, he was greedy after something that he should not have been. By the way, covetousness is not limited to those who may have money. I think there are as many poor people who are covetous as rich people. They covet things that they ought not to. One of the heroes in my life has been Jim Elliott. I was in Texas when Jim Elliott was killed by the Aka Indians, and it was spread all across our country, Jim Elliott. His wife took his diary and gave to the world the things that he'd written in his diary. One of the things that he had written in his diary while he was a student at Wheaton College in Wheaton, Illinois, he wrote this one day before he actually knew what was going to happen to him, that he would be killed by a spear from a jungle Indian. This is what he wrote. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. He gave what he couldn't keep. That was his life for the cause of Christ, preaching the gospel to jungle Indians. But he gained what he could not lose, eternal life. So let's take this to heart today from the Word of God, 1 Timothy chapter 6. And we'll continue next week as we preach the Word of God. Pray with me for just a moment. Father, thank you for the privilege.